In the previous video, we got to the point where we were trying to solve the Bessel function uh, or the Bessel equation um, where v equals zero. And we were able to find that we got r is equal to zero. Um, and we also found that C1 was equal to zero. And then we finally got to this recurrence relation based on the fact that r was the, or r equals zero was the dual solution or the dual root solution to the initial, the initial equation. And so now what we're going to do is we're going to use the method of iteration to see if we can come up with some sort of closed form for our Bessel function. So we have k, and then we're just going to figure out what c sub k plus 2 equals negative c k over k plus 2 square is going to look like each time. So have 1, 2, and let's just go up to 0, 1, 2, and maybe 3 just to say we have one of those. All right, just in case. If, that, if we don't need it, then we won't use it. So substituting 0, we get the opposite of c sub naught divided by k square, or in other words, 2 square, excuse me, since k is equal to 0. Um, so that'll be opposite negative c sub naught over 2 square. Nice and simple. Um, c, and this should be c sub 2, not c sub naught, excuse me. All right. So this will be c3. And C3 is going to be equal to the opposite of C1 divided by 3 squared. Right? Um, however, we know that C1 is equal to 0, so that means that C3 is going to be equal to 0. And we've seen this sort of pattern before, not with method of Frobenius, but um, before when they were around ordinary points. Um, C4. C4 is going to be the opposite of C sub 2 over 4 squared. And this is where we have to be really sneaky about how we're going to write the denominator and also how we're going to back substitute because we know what c sub 2 is. c sub 2 is this. So we're going to substitute that back in. We get the opposite of negative c naught over 2 square. And then we can rewrite the denominator as 2 square times another 2 square. All right, and even sneakier, now this is the really sneaky part, obviously these just become a positive, so we get C naught, um, we're going to combine, so let's just combine these two squares to get 2 to the fourth, and then really sneaky, what we're going to do is we're going to rewrite 2 square as 1 times 2 square. All right, and how do we know to do that? Well, we don't know. All right, somebody gave us a hint. And so hopefully that'll be helpful as we go along. All right, so we probably know what's going to now happen with uh, C5. All right, so C5 is going to be equal to the opposite of C3 divided by um, 3 plus 2 square, which would be 5 square. But that doesn't matter because we know C3 is equal to 0. All right. C6. Well, C6 is going to be the opposite of C4 divided by um, 4 plus 2 square, or in other words, that's going to be 6 square. All right, now here's a little bit of magic. We're going to rewrite this as opposite C0 over 2 to the fourth, 1 times 2 square divided by. Now, 6 square, check this out, we can rewrite that as 2 square times 3 square. And now what we see is that we can combine 2 to the 4th and 2 square to get that to be 2 to the 6th power. So it's going to be opposite C0 over 2 to the 6th power. And then notice that we have 1 square times 2 square, and that's going to be in the denominator again. So we're going to get quantity 1 times 2 
times 3 squared. All right, so now we're starting to see a really cool pattern that emerges with this. All right, let's just do this one more time just to satisfy our curiosity to make sure that it is indeed doing what we think it's going to be. Now, we know C7. All right, C7 is going to be the opposite of C5 over um, whatever it is. It's going to be 7 squared, but that's just going to be equal to 0 anyway, so that doesn't matter. All right, let's hope that C8 does what we want it, what we think it's going to do. All right, so it's going to be the opposite of negative C6 um, divided by 8 squared. Um, but we already know what C6 looks like. C6 is going to look like this right here this negative c naught over 2 to the 6th. And as you can imagine, we're going to be really sneaky with how we write that 8 squared. So this is now going to become the opposite of the opposite of c naught over 2 to the 6th, 1 times 2 times 3 squared. And 8, we can rewrite 8 as 2 squared times 4 squared. All right. And now we're starting to see that each time that we go through an iteration of this. A couple things are happening. It looks like we're getting two more powers of two, and then we're also getting the next successive perfect square as a factor. All right, so we can now rewrite this as c naught over two to the eighth um, times one times two times three times four square. That's two to the eighth and 1 times 2 times 3 times 4 square. All right, so what's happening with this? In other words, if I need to make a guess for the nth iteration of this, all right, well, it looks like that this 8 is going to be the exponent, okay? Um, and so it looks like these match up. It also looks like that the, no, the factorial, because this is pretty obviously a factorial, is half of what the index is. All right? And so when we notice that also that only the even powers, okay, so 6, 4, 6, 8, in other words, any odd power is going to go away. All right? And so what does that mean? Let's put all that together and see if we can get something out of this, okay? So we know that we have to have an even power. And remember, even is defined as 2n. Right? Um, and then also what we notice is that the factorial, right? So this might be like an n factorial, all right? Because half of that. And so maybe what we could say is that if we were to guess what's going to happen on the nth iteration, we could say that this is going to be c naught over 2 to the 2n times n factorial squared. Um, and then we also have alternating. So, and by alternating, I mean that we have positive for one live term, and then we have negative for another live term, and we keep having that pattern, all right? So, um, to remember to be able to satisfy that, we need a minus one to the n. And we can define this to be c sub n, all right? So, what does that mean that our solution is going to look like, okay? So, remember at the beginning of the problem, we had series n equals zero to infinity c sub n x to the n plus r, all right? Well, we know r is equal to zero, right? And what we're gonna do is we're gonna replace all of the n's with 2n except for the factorial, all right? The factorial, like we said, is gonna be half of the value of c, okay? So if this was like c8, we'd wanna make sure, and we don't wanna write it as n over two, although we certainly could if we wanted to, but I think a better way to write this would be series n equals zero to infinity. For c sub n, we're gonna write that as minus one to the n times x, or I'm sorry, c naught, divided by two to the two n times n factorial squared. And then we have 
x to the 2n plus 0. Right? Or, in other words, that's just x to the 2n. We don't need the plus 0, but just reminding you that we do have to substitute the value of r back in. So just in case you are asked to find um, a different Bessel function. All right. And one final way that we can try to rewrite this to get a final solution for this, we could say j sub dot of x. All right. So remember, 0 is the, the order, because remember we had v was equal to 0 at the very beginning of the problem. So this is now going to become, we could just factor out the c naught, and we could have series n equals 0 to infinity um, minus 1 to the n um, x to the 2n divided by 2 to the 2n n factorial square. All right, and this is a very common function that you are all going to probably see um, later in your mathematical, engineering, physical um, coursework. This just comes up a lot. All right, so, um, and remember before, what we could do is we could expand this and we could start writing out the terms. Okay, so for instance, we could get a polynomial for this, j sub naught of x. Um, if we plugged in 0 for n, everything would just kind of go away and we get c0. Um, and if we plugged in 1, we would get minus c0 um, because of the negative there. Um, x squared over 4 times 1 factorial, which would be 1. So it would be c0 x squared over 4. And then if we just plugged in 2, just to kind of give you an idea as to what this would look like, the next one would be c0, um, x to the 4th. So we would have 2 to the 2 times 2, so it would be 2 to the 4th, which is 16. And then we'd have another 2 squared, which would be 4, so 16 fours would be 64, etc. Right? Um, and then we could go ahead and find the initial value for this. So for instance, if we just said j at 0 is equal to 0, all right, then we could clearly see that c0 would be equal to 0 at this point, um, and th if this were an initial condition, and that would imply that our Bessel function j0 of x, um, given this initial condition, would be equal to, um, well, I guess c0 couldn't be equal to 0, so we might have to have like something like j sub naught is equal to 1 or something like that. And so we could get like 1 minus x squared over 4 plus x to the 4th over 64 minus dot dot dot. All right. And then what we could do is we could start doing those plots. Okay. So remember before, earlier, we took a look at what the Bessel function looked like up here. All right. And that's how we can kind of start getting what the Bessel function is going to look like. Um, and again, that's if for some reason uh, we wanted to go through and get an initial value for this. All right. So, um, but again, this is just our solution, giving you an idea as to what we would use, ever use one of these sorts of methods of Frobenius for. So in the next video, what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at another one of these um, series solutions to a Bessel equation. This time it's going to have a little bit more precise um, solution, and we're going to kind of make it into a transcendental um, mixed with some sort of algebraic solution. So it'll be pretty fun, I think. Thank you.